The purpose of my session here today is to kind of set up what you're about to see for the rest of the day. So we have a lot of really good um, technical speakers today who are going to be taking you through some of the things about how you as developers can start to implement bits of Bing into um, what you're doing. But uh, what I was asked to do today was to give you a bit of a, um, a view into how Microsoft sees um, the future evolving, specific specifically with, with search. Um, and so before I do that, and I'm sure there will be many, many people who will, who will refer to this, I want to talk about um, our mission and the importance of um, having a mission to be able to rally around. So this is the first of two NASA stories that I'm going to tell you. There's a lovely uh, anecdote uh, from the 70s when uh, NASA were doing some um, internal uh, employee satisfaction um, checks. And when they went through all of the data, there were a couple of people who came out significantly higher than the average employee. And there's one guy uh, who's the janitor um, who did, did a pretty sort of uh, mind-numbing job of just sweeping the floors of the, of the halls of um, the NASA uh, research labs. But his scores were absolutely off the chart for employee satisfaction. So they, they brought him in and they said, what, why is it that you're, that you're such a, a happy you know, worker when actually, by most normal standards, you're doing a pretty menial job? And he said, well, I, I don't see it as menial at all. I'm helping putting man on the moon. And I think the thing that really resonates with that is that if everybody buys into the mission, you get something which is really powerful and really, really promising for what you can achieve. Now, at Microsoft, we have a new mission. You're going to see other people refer to this slide, I'm sure, today. But um, the mission is something which I think we are all rallying around and is really critical to the future of our business. The old Microsoft mission, uh, for those of you who have been around in tech for a while, uh, was a pretty sort of uh, simple one, but it was a technological one. The old mission was a computer on every desk in every home and in every office. And if you think about maybe most of the Western world, I think by and large we've achieved that mission. The new mission is something which is eminently more human. We plan to help to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Now, that's a very different mindset and actually a much more ambitious goal because there are so many things that we can do as Microsoft to empower people to achieve more in their daily lives at work and at play. And every person at Microsoft internalizes that mission to think, how can I contribute to actually helping people to empower? Now, for me, when I think about how I personally internalize that mission and uh, for what I do at Bing, I'm a massive comic book nerd. And so I always refer back to um, heroes and trying to save the world. For me, the mission uh, for Bing is to save the world from a Google monopoly. We're trying to give people a credible alternative in search. Now, a number of you just chuckled there. We understand the sort of the, the greatness of, or the difficulty, the steepness of the climb that we have to face if we are going to challenge Google. But the good thing, I think, is that history is on our side. No empire manages to ever last forever. And the thing is, is that even though Google is a phenomenally large company, phenomenally successful at what they do, not only are they one of the richest companies in the world and have one of the best uh, teams of engineers working on their algorithm, oh, and by the way, they also own the verb for the thing to the market to which they help to create, we truly believe that Bing can become the world's best search engine and can actually overcome Google. Now, why do I have that optimism and confidence? Well, partly because of our mission, partly because of some of the things that I'm going to show you today, but partly also because of history. There are plenty of examples throughout history that show that the incumbent can be overcome. And even when you own the verb, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're always going to be the number one player. I want to give you a very quick example of that right now. Hands up, those of you in the room who own a vacuuming device in your household. Yeah, this should be all of you. <laughs> okay, hands up again if you own a Hoover vacuuming device. Three of you. 
Okay, how many of you own a Dyson? Nearly half of the room. And that's the point. Bing aspires to be the Dyson of search. That's what we're going for. And what I want to talk you through is how we see ourselves getting there and how that's going to um, help you uh, in your roles going forward. So if I think about um, the future and where we see search evolving, there are sort of three core things that we're looking for. And sort of keeping with the space theme, um, if we're thinking about planets aligning, there are three planetary uh, things which we're looking for in terms of search. The search is going to become more pervasive, more predictive, and more proactive. And what does that mean? Let's kick off with uh, pervasive. We all inherently understand that uh, technology is becoming increasingly something that is available to everyone, anywhere, anytime, any place. You now have access to the internet at the touch of a button. Your phone is never more than a couple of meters away from you. Um, worryingly, you, we check our phones something like 150 times a day. It's often the first thing in the morning that you check and the last thing at night, whereas it used to be that you would turn to your significant other, now you turn to your mobile. What that says about the uh, state of the country is, is up to you to decide. But we know that we can now get search wherever we are, whatever we're doing at any time. And this uh, idea of pervasiveness is something that is increasingly important, particularly to Microsoft. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what that means in a bit. Predictive is the idea that we can start to anticipate what's going to happen in the future by using search and using um, more data and trends and plugging that together to understand what is going to be happening and what are going to be your future needs. And if we can anticipate those future needs, then we can start to do something about it and we can start to make search proactive. And what that means is that we're going to be able to start giving you the answers to questions that you haven't even thought to ask yet. If we can get to that stage, then I think and if we can encapsulate that within the Microsoft ecosystem, then I truly believe that this is how we're going to start to challenge Google. So here's our, our list, pervasive, predictive, proactive. And I'll be sort of going through this throughout the presentation. Now, we're drawing all of these together in what we call our new search intelligence framework, which is Cortana. So Cortana, uh, for those of you who haven't sort of come across it yet, is our kind of version of Siri. It's um, a digital assistant which is there to help you achieve mm -hmm. tasks in your daily life, whether it be at work or at play. Cortana is there to, to know and to understand you and to help you get stuff done. Now, how does that work in this framework of, of the new types of way that we think about search? Firstly, pervasive. So Cortana is pervasive across all of the different Microsoft ecosystems. So whether that is in, um, from the smallest uh, device and, and uh, smartphone up to the very biggest from um, smart TVs. So whether it's on your phone, whether it's on Windows 10, whether it's on a tablet, um, increasingly we're going to see it with new device types like uh, HoloLens. Um, it's on Xbox bringing you together to have a seamless interactivity with one intelligent system that understands who you are and what you need at a given time. Now, when we talk, I think, about the sort of the future of devices, I think it's really important that we don't just um, narrow that down to thinking about um, having a screen interface. This is actually a, uh, a video from our friends at Google that they're working on a, uh, a, a interface that allows you to be able to um, weave into a fabric a touch sensitive um, receptor so that we don't necessarily have to think about stuff anymore in terms of having a device, a phone to actually pull out. In the future, something like this will be able to literally tap on our jacket and then make the search that we need and it will be able to respond to that touch as a different command. Now, if you think about um, something that we're working on with HoloLens, the idea is that here, that the entire room becomes the interface that you want uh, to use. So this is a um, retail example where somebody's browsing through a website using HoloLens, um, but then they're literally placing the chair in the arena that they're in, in their kitchen, to see what it would look like. Does it fit neatly under the table? What does it look like in the context? And then when they order it, um, you can see that it fits perfectly into this particular scenario. Now, at the moment, HoloLens is still, is, or whilst it's um, completely untethered, it's still a relatively um, bulky device um, for the head. But you'd be mad to think that this is the sort of the epitome of what this uh, particular device can achieve. The idea here is that this is supposed to be a view of where we're going um, and that the devices obviously 
And with Moore's law, are just going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and easier for us to be able to manoeuvre. Now, I want to give you a quick example of how search today is starting to become much more um, pervasive across all of the different experiences that we have. And really what I want to highlight is how we're moving away from search as the experience that we sort of know and think about it today. So if you look at this, I, this is an example of me sort of clicking on a, uh, on a news article. Now, let's say I want to find out more about the Duchess of Cambridge. What I can do here is literally highlight and right click. And Cortana now brings all of that information which I could ever possibly want about the Duchess of Cambridge into the experience that I'm at. So this is available in Edge today. And what it does is it's bringing in all of the um, information from uh, different websites, so the likes of um, Wikipedia and from the web, and giving me a search experience without the need for me to be able to actually make a search. If you think about how this differs from the current search experience, where you have to, if you wanted to do this exact same thing in Google, what you'd have to do is you'd have to stop reading your article, open a new browser, go to Google, type in Duchess of Cambridge, click on an answer, and then you'd get the information. What we're trying to do here is to reduce the number of steps that you need to take and to shorten the gap between users and information. We feel that if we can do that and if we can make search totally pervasive, that it's just there in the experience that you're already in, then that will start to endear you to our platform and to our products. And predictive intelligence is really interesting. There are so many interesting things that we're doing here. I think we'll hear a little bit more about um, Bing Predicts, which is uh, something that we've used to be able to um, take the algorithms that we have in Bing and taking the data that we start to uh, take from lots of different sources to predict um, really important uh, moments in time. Uh, things like Eurovision, you know, the, the really hard hitting stuff. Um, but we actually, we, we've done this as a, as a thought experiment, but actually as a genuine thing. We've been able to predict things like uh, the outcome of Eurovision. We've predicted um, winners of World Cups. We predicted things like um, X Factor. Uh, there are lots of, of uh, the one thing we didn't quite get was the election, but um, you know, there are, there are so many things that, that are wrong with that that I'm not even going to start. The really interesting thing is that we can start to get much more granular and um, start to um, predict far, far better than any existing sort of YouGov poll or, or, um, or polling system by the fact that we have this um, wide-ranging network of things that can start to bring together uh, information from lots of disparate data sources. And one of the things I, I did say, that, that, you know, somewhat jokingly, that we're doing it this with the hard-hitting things like Eurovision, one of the things that we have done as, a, as an experiment using this um, kind of technology, uh, I think can be, have a profound effect on um, the world of medical science. So what we did was um, start to take a whole bunch of uh, people who'd been diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer and then we looked at their um, search history to try and see, are there patterns which could um, be used to try and um, develop an early flag sort of warning system? So that if somebody starts to um, use a particular type of behavior, if somebody exhibits a search behavior which, um, is, uh, sort of, um, which matches the, the people that we've seen get cancer, could we use that as a way to be able to give people a warning to say, we think you should probably go and see the doctor. Maybe you should get yourself checked out. Now, one of the amazing things when we ran this through a couple of tests was that the false positive rate uh, of the model was less than one in 100,000. That's pretty amazing when you think about how many different variables there are. You know, we're not just looking for things which are very late stage, obvious signs of cancer, like if somebody's searching Hmm. What does it look like to have prostate cancer? We're looking way, way before. And one of the really interesting things here is that if you can get an early detection rate of prostate cancer, you can double your survival rate chances. So these are, uh, this is not something that we have as a product right now, but these are some of the things that we're thinking about, about how we can use search in a way to be able to predict uh, what's going to happen in the future in order to try and help people uh, in a very real way. 
The final thing that I wanted to um, think about in terms of the future of search is being proactive. How do we get this proactive intelligence in front of people? One of the best examples we have that, with that today with Cortana is this amazing ability where the more that she starts to understand you as an individual, she'll start to learn um, things which are relevant to you, things like where you live, but also things uh, like your daily routine um, and syncing with things like your calendar. So one of the things that um, I did recently, I had a, a flight over to Seattle. Cortana um, proactively warned me uh, that there was traffic on the motorway and that if I wanted to make sure that I got to Heathrow in time, that I would have to leave 20 minutes earlier than what I'd currently planned. Now, the reason why she was able to do that for me was because she had access to my calendar, she had access to uh, my uh, British Airways app, she knew when the flight was, she knew where I was currently, and she knew uh, what I was planning to do in terms of the amount of time I'd set aside in order to get to the airport. Now the thing is, is that I didn't ask her to check the traffic for me. She just did that on my behalf because she thought it'd be something which I would find useful. And actually it was incredibly useful because if she hadn't done that, then I would have missed my flight. But this is where we're going in terms of being able to, where the machines will start to understand and the algorithms start to understand more and more about us, they'll be able to make inferences on our behalf and start to take actions on our behalf as well, either through prompt notifications or if you allow them to actually take actions uh, for you. I envisage a world in the not too distant future where Cortana is syncing not only with my calendar but also with my fridge. She'll be able to see what I have in my fridge and sync with my uh, diary and say, James, here's a quick reminder, mum and dad are coming for the weekend and you know that mum only drinks skimmed milk you haven't got any skimmed milk in the fridge, do you want me to order some for you? And if I say yes, then sure enough, it'll be delivered uh, in a couple of hours. This is where we're going in terms of proactivity. Now, all of this means that we've got to start thinking about search in a very different way. We can't just think in the, in the way that we have for uh, most of the last sort of 15 or 20 years in terms of a box and 10 blue links and search as a destination. We're going so far beyond that. And one of the things that we're seeing is that the, the evolution of search means that there are going to be three new protagonists within this new world. Those protagonists are the user, the digital assistant, and bots. So let me talk you through that. So you, the user, you're the person who ultimately <coughs> all of this work is being done for in, in the background. Then you're going to have the agent, the digital assistant, who's going to be the super bot, the, 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 the intelligence that understands you as an individual, you as a user, your preferences, your likes, your habits, and also has um, the one that you give uh, and empower the control to be able to take actions on your behalf. Then there's going to be the bots. And what we see is that the future is going to be something where companies are going to have bots working on their behalf to interact with digital assistants in order to be able to speed up and make transactions uh, and conversions that much simpler. Let me show you what that, that could look like uh, with a little demo. So this is uh, an example of three people having a conversation within Skype. And they're trying to, before they plan their meeting, um, of course, no meeting can, can truly happen uh, until we've got caffeine. So they're going to order coffee. Um, so you'll see as they're starting to um, have the chat, what they do is they bring Cortana into the conversation, into Skype. And Cortana then contacts one of uh, three available coffee bots to come into the conversation. Now the bot then starts to have a conversation with the three participants and starts asking them questions. What kind of coffee would you like? Do you want an Americano? Do you want a flat white? How much sugar do you like? Um, you know, are you going for a, a normal milk or skinny milk? Um, each of the participants then starts to talk to the bot to tell them what they want. They click on things and then there's a, a little bit later it will say, okay, where are you? So it works out where they are. And then the, the, um, the difficult question, uh, okay, who's going to pay for this? One person decides to pick up the check and then literally with just one click, Cortana will share that person's payment information with the bot. The bot makes the payment, uh, verifies it, and then says the coffee is on its way. Think about how that 
conversation has completely changed the paradigm of what we currently think of of having to order coffee. Right now, if you wanted to do that, you'd have to send your assistant uh, to go to a coffee shop with an order and then go and pay and bring it back. Or, uh, depending on how close you are to a coffee shop, you might, you might uh, ring them up and order, ask them to, to deliver. This takes all of that hassle out of the way. You can start to do that instantly all through Skype. So the, the really important thing here is that we have a framework now where you don't have to leave the situation that you're at in order to be able to make a pretty complicated transaction. Now, the, the beauty about this is that you're already in the experience. You don't have to download a new app or create a new system. Everything is taken care of for you. And you'll hear today more about um, this new paradigm that we're starting to call conversation as a platform. And uh, some of the other speakers are going to be touching on that. Now, crucial and critical to this being able to develop further beyond a simple coffee example is the fact that we need to be able to give contextual uh, explanations um, and search which is relevant to a particular individual. Okay? Um, let me explain very quickly what that means. So the thing is, is that as a, as a whole, the biggest difficulty that we have is with people. You as people, you as users, are terrible at being able to ask for what you actually want. The best example I have of this recently is uh, with uh, last summer's blockbuster release of Jurassic World. We saw at Bing that there were millions of people who were searching, not for Jurassic World, but were searching for Jurassic Park release date. So how do we as an engine try and understand what is the actual intent behind that search? If we give people the actual answer to the question that they've asked, well, the release date of Jurassic Park was uh, June 1993. But we have to make an inference that contextually, if the new movie is coming out in just a couple of weeks, people are probably not that interested in the original from 1993. So even though they're asking for Jurassic Park, what we want to do is to serve up the information for the forthcoming movie, which is Jurassic World. And so that's exactly what we did. If you look at this experience, we've given them the answer to the correct question, which they haven't asked. But we also give them options to be able to uh, book cinema tickets through, uh, through the SERP at their local cinema, which is contextually relevant to their uh, geolocation. Uh, we give them the ability to click on a trailer to have a look at the latest um, reviews from uh, review sites which offer them, you know, is this a movie which is actually worth seeing? These are things where we're starting to bring together lots of different information into a single search experience that gives people all of the information they could possibly need. Now, this idea of context is absolutely critical to the future of how we see relevance evolving within search. So I want to move on to the second NASA story of, of my presentation today. <coughs> Does anyone know what this is? We're in a, a room of uh, what I hope are sort of fairly techie developers, I thought, might know. OK. So this is Pioneer 10. This is, or this was, the first NASA probe that um, had exit velocity of our, of our um, uh, atmosphere and actually managed to get out into the solar system. Um, this was in 1972. NASA designed this probe. And it had a number of different missions. It was there to, um, to explore what was out there, um, to try and uh, take pictures of uh, stuff beyond what our tele current telescopes could see. Um, but it also had a, a, a humanitarian mission. And so one person was uh, given the task of designing the message from all of humanity to any potential alien life that might exist out there. A message which says, we're here, come and find us. How on earth do you put that into something which is intelligible? Well, this is what they came up with. <coughs> um, and it, I think it's fascinating because it, it uncovers so many problems with the issue of context and with symbolic representation. 
This is um, part. This was put on a gold anodized plate within uh, the shuttle, within the probe uh, of Pioneer 10. And what it's there to do is to try and explain to any alien life form that managed to come across this um, where we are in the universe and who we are and what we do. Now, never mind intelligent alien life form. How many of you intelligent human beings can piece together the information which is contained within this anodized plate? What is it that you're supposed to, what's the message that you're supposed to take here? To me, I think this is absolutely crazy, but <coughs> let me just walk you through some of the key sort of highlights of this particular plate. Let's have a look at this, this bit up here, top left. Uh, for those of you over there, uh, the, the, the bit at the top here. This is the um, chemical symbol for hydrogen. And uh, so what they did here, the, the thinking behind this was that any alien life that came across would need to know what kind of uh, atmosphere we had. And so if they knew that we had uh, hydrogen, but not only uh, did we know that hydrogen existed, but also that we um, understood conceptually the different spins of electrons, which is the way that we've uh, very carefully characterized that, that um, symbol there, that they'd know that we had a certain sophistication of scientific understanding. Now, how on earth is anybody supposed to grasp that from the fact that we've taken a symbol? Clearly, hydrogen doesn't look like that. That's just how we've chosen to represent hydrogen in a scientific formulae. Then they have to also understand that um, these people here, that these are representations of human beings, the people who are actually on the planet. How on earth would they be able to work out that um, the, the two folks on the right are, are human beings rather than the two circles on the left, which, uh, you know, the, the, the people on the right aren't actually chemical symbols for something else. Um, <laughs> brilliantly, the way that this is designed is that the, the reason why the, the man has got uh, bits coming out of his, his head is that they were supposed to be able to differentiate from that, that the uh, the height of the average human was in proportion to the height of the overall probe. Then they've got here a spatial recognition down the bottom that the probe, which by the way is bigger than almost Saturn, came from the third planet in the solar system and this is then binary code here which tells them the exact geolocation of Earth in relation to the rest of the solar system. A apart from anything else, like, if you see some of the complexities and some of the issues here of, of alien life form trying to interpret this message, take the very simple gesture of the man who's holding up his hand. How were they ever supposed to differentiate that this was the universal symbol of peace rather than a symbol of halt or aggression or stay away? And yet this was the message that we sent. This was the best effort that we had. Uh, that NASA came up with. Now, the only reason that I tell you this story is, bit, well, firstly, I find it quite funny, but the reason why I'm telling you this is there is a huge issue that we have with trying to understand context. And yet that is the expectation which is placed on us as a search engine every single day. The expectation is that you understand everything that is relevant to me as an individual and that you will be able to give me the thing that I want from very limited information which you give me as a searcher. Now the, the key to unlocking all of this clearly is data. I'm not going to talk about uh, big data because I'm sure you've all been to conferences and been bored to tears with explanations about what, what that is and what that could involve. But what I want to talk to you about is how we as Bing are starting to think about this, uh, this problem and what are some of the things that we can start to unlock when we get access to more personalized information and start to draw strands between different data sets. Well, the first thing that we're able to do is we're going to be able to give you contextually relevant um, information in the moment that you're in to be able to help you to achieve what you need in a given moment. So, Going back to my, one of my favorite topics, coffee. Right now, let's say that you're um, in, the, in the hunt for the perfect coffee. For me, that means if I'm walking down a high street, normally I'd be willing to walk an extra couple of hundred meters to go to a Starbucks rather than to go to a Cafe Nero or to go to a Costa. I just happen to prefer Starbucks as my preferred choice of coffee. Now, so how do I then um, 
make sure that I'm getting the right information at the right time? Well, that depends on my context. Like I say, normally I'd be willing to walk a little bit further in order to go and get my coffee. But let's say it's Sunday and it's pissing down with rain. Suddenly I don't want to walk that extra couple of hundred meters. Now if I make the same request that I just want coffee, actually what I'm after is just going uh, to the closest place that I can get coffee. And so if the context changes, if it's raining, I want it to direct me to uh, Costa if that is closer than the closest Starbucks. Similarly, when we're thinking about um, TV viewing, we want to be able to give information which is relevant to the person who's sitting there. So it really frustrates me, for example, right now that Netflix doesn't have the ability to be able to differentiate when I'm sitting down to watch TV and when I'm sitting down with my uh, wife to watch TV. We have very different viewing habits when we're together than when we're separate. When I'm by myself, I want to be able to watch something like Bake Off, which my wife hates. When we're together, uh, we want to watch something like uh, Game of Thrones, which she absolutely adores. Why can't we differentiate the fact using a simple piece of information what's relevant to offer people at the right time? And the third thing that we're going to do is uh, offer something which is culturally relevant. So um, it's absolutely imperative to understand the background of where people come from in order to make uh, an inference on the information which will be relevant to them. I want to give you an example of what this looks like with a company who really understand the relevance of um, a sending a right message uh, that will resonate with different cultures, and that's Disney. Let me show you this video. So, how was the first day of school? It was fine, I guess. I don't know. Do you ever look at someone and wonder what is going on inside their head? Did you guys pick up on that? Sure, sure did. Well, something's wrong. We're going to find out what's happening but we'll need support. Signal the husband. <clears throat> With a nice pass over the reef, comes across center ice. <clears throat> Uh-oh, she's looking at us. What did she say? What? Oh, oh, sorry, sir. No one was listening. Is it garbage night? Uh, we left the toilet seat up. What? What is it, woman? What? Signal him again. Ah. So, Riley, how was school? Todos lo vieron, ¿verdad? Sí. Le pasa algo. Averiguaremos lo que pasa, pero con apoyo. Hazle señas al esposo. Oh, oh, no se está mirando. Eh, ¿Qué fue lo que dijo? ¿Qué? Oh, oh, lo siento, señor. Nadie escuchó nada. ¿Sacar la basura? ¿El asiento del sanitario? ¿Qué? ¿Qué quieres, mujer? ¿Qué? Hazle otra seña. Ah, oye, Riley, ¿qué tal la escuela? ¿Qué? ¿En serio? Ok. So the point of this is that even if you don't speak Spanish, it still makes sense, right? So it's a universal joke. But notice the subtle difference between the two clips. For the, um, for the clip which was released in Canada, the sport that the people watched was ice hockey, Canada's most uh, sort of famous, most uh, prolific sport. For um, the Spanish release uh, in South America, they show football. Now, why do they do that? They do that because Disney understands that if they're going to create heartwarming messages that are going to be family oriented, which relate to their audience, they have to make it so that it is relatable, that it doesn't jar with people when they watch it. And the, what's one of the most um, interesting things is that they never release just one version of the movie. There's always a separate release depending on where it's going out in the world. Now, this idea of cultural significance is really, really important. It's um, something that uh, I've had to deal with personally in my life, and so the, the sort of one of the final stories I want to talk to you about is the hardest presentation I, I ever had to give. Uh, this is a picture of me and my, my wife on our wedding day, and so uh, you'll see that uh, uh, my wife is um, Chinese, so she's actually from Taiwan. The hardest presentation I had to give was on, on my wedding day, I had to be able to deliver my groom speech Half in English, half in Chinese, and I don't speak any Mandarin. Any Mandarin speakers in the room? No, didn't think so. Okay, so the problem with Mandarin is that if you don't understand how to pronounce the words, you can dramatically change what you're actually saying. So this is the first sentence that I wanted to deliver as my speech in English, which I then got translated into Mandarin, which was to say, to show respect to my Taiwanese family, I want to talk to them in Chinese. The thing is, if you don't speak Chinese, then that's just a whole bunch of gobbledygook. 
but if you, even if you do, this is the English version of Chinese, each of these little in, intonations here tell you how to say the word. And if you get that wrong, you absolutely fundamentally change the meaning of the language that you're saying. Okay? Give you a quick example. This last two words here, Jing Yi. If I say that correctly, Jing Yi, versus incorrectly, Jing Yi. You've probably just heard me, to your ear, that might sound like I've just said the same thing twice. Trust me, that is the difference between me saying that I want to show my respect to my family and me showing them something else entirely. <laughs> so you can imagine my, my sort of nervousness as I'm about to stand up and give this presentation to 150 people. And if I get this wrong, this could be the quickest move from marriage to divorce in history. Now, how are we trying to, to change this? Well, one of the things that we're using with the Bing algorithm, with the APIs, is to improve translation between languages. This is something that's been a really difficult nut to crack for a long, long time. But we finally got to a, a ability where we can start to have meaningful conversations in real time. It's something that we call tr Skype Translate. Mandarin is difficult, very difficult. Even the locals say so. I've learned some basic Mandarin, or what I call survival Chinese, but when I'm out traveling in the provinces, they don't always get me. Can you understand me now, Xiangbin? You speak Chinese. Thanks, Changbin. Your English has improved too. It's really nice to see you again, and also nice to talk to you. So, do you know where I can get a good picture from up in the hills? Yes, there are many secrets. What time should we start out for the top? Thursday, we start at 5 in the morning. That's gonna hurt. Communication is of course the key to my career. In order to be able to explore a new culture, you need to be able to communicate with its people. That's when the barriers come down and you discover the real China, and its true beauty and its secrets open up. Beautiful. Okay, I'm now well over time. I have one more story, which is really final thing that I want to leave you with. This is not just about speech. This is not just about being able to understand um, different languages and put them into a context. The final thing that we're doing, which I think is the, the real sort of future research, is with trying to understand not just text and speech, but also things, objects, visual things. This is one of the things that we started to do about six years ago, was how do we teach a machine to see and recognize objects. We did this initially with dogs, where you could take a picture of a dog and Cortana would be able to recognize what breed of dog it is. We then took that forward to a thing called CaptionBot. Uh, this is, a, again, another photo from my wedding. Uh, what CaptionBot does is it um, visually understands what's going on within the image and tells you what it sees. So here it says, I think it's a man holding a knife to cut a wedding cake, and he seems not particularly happy. Well, you'll see <laughs> the reason why I'm not particularly happy is you know the context now is because I'm about to give a speech, which could be the end of my very short-lived wedding. Um, but uh, see the difficulty in the complexity of that image. How does it understand that what I'm cutting into is a wedding cake? Well, it does that because it can see that typically when you see a, a, a man in a suit and a girl in a white dress with a veil, and they're cutting into something with a, okay, this is a sword, but you know, sword, knife, semantics, that that's probably a wedding cake that we're cutting into. The great thing about this is that all of these things are available to you as developers as APIs, which you can start to um, use through your own means. So you can start to do things like um, understanding visual recognition of uh, facial features and starting to pull that together to understand whether somebody's happy or sad or whether they are um, fearful or regretful. 
Now all of this comes back to that mission, empowering people to be able to do more. We are only going to do that if we truly empower every individual. That means taking into account not just the tech developers, not just the early adopters, but everybody, including very niche groups like the blind. So ladies and gentlemen, my final thing that I want to show you, something that I'm incredibly proud of to um, have seen and to um, have seen develop within Microsoft, this is one of the most critical things I think we're doing with search right now, and that's giving vision to the blind. I'm Sakib Sheikh. I lost my sight when I was seven, and shortly after that, I went to a school for the blind. And that's where I was introduced to talking computers. And that really opened up a whole new world of opportunities. I joined Microsoft 10 years ago as a software engineer. I love making things which improve people's lives. And one of the things I've always dreamt of since I was at university was this idea of something that could tell you at any moment what's going on around you. I think it's a man jumping in the air doing a trick on a skateboard. I teamed up with like-minded engineers to make an app which lets you know who and what is around you. It's based on top of the Microsoft Intelligence APIs, which makes it so much easier to make this kind of thing. The app runs on smartphones, but also on the pivot head smart glasses. When you're talking to a bigger group, sometimes you can talk and talk and there's no response and you think, is everyone listening really well, or are they half asleep? And you never know. I see two faces, 40-year-old man with a beard looking surprised, 20-year-old woman looking happy. The app can describe the general age and gender of the people around me and what their emotions are, which is incredible. One of the things that's most useful about the app is the ability to read out text. Hello, good afternoon. Here's your menu. Great, thank you. I can use the app on my phone to take a picture of the menu, and it's going to guide me on how to take that correct photo. Move camera to the bottom right and away from the document. And then it'll recognize the text. Read me the headings. I see appetizers, salads, paninis, pizzas, pastas. Years ago, this was science fiction. I never thought it would be something that you could actually do. But artificial intelligence is improving at an ever faster rate. And I'm really excited to see where we can take this. Hey. As engineers, we're always standing on the shoulders of giants, building on top of what went before. And in this case, we've taken years of research from Microsoft Research to pull this off. I think it's a young girl throwing an orange frisbee in the park. For me, it's about taking that far-off dream and building it one step at a time. I think this is just the beginning. Okay, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, that's it from me. All I wanted to say to, to round off is that this is the future that we envisage. You have access to all of these things. You can start embedding all of these things within your apps as developers. This is all freely available through the Microsoft APIs. If you want to find out more about how we're doing this, come and talk to me either in the break or at lunchtime. Otherwise, thank you very much. We are here to save the future, to save the world from a search monopoly. We're doing it one query at a time. Thank you very much.